Well, I can't believe we've got to the end of our series already. I really hope that you have enjoyed it as much as I have. So Ezra chapter 10, we have so much to talk about today. So let's just jump right into it. So turn or tap in your Bibles to Ezra chapter 10. And just uh, while you're turning there, uh, just to set the scene for you a little bit. So Ezra, this book ends rather unusually, unspectacularly. The scene at the end is quite solemn and somber, but it also just ends literally with another list of names, about 110 names that I'm not going to read today. Uh, and we've come across lists of names in Ezra already, Ezra chapter 2, Ezra chapter 8. But in both of those instances, that list of names was kind of a list of heroes you would want your name to be on that list when we get to the end of Ezra with this list of names, you do not want your name to be on that list. This is not like uh, the, the list of credits at the end of a movie. This is a list of shame. So it's a list of names of people who had disobeyed God, who had sinned by intermarrying with foreign women of the, of the land around them. Now, we looked at last week, we looked at that has nothing to do with race, but about religion. So let's get into it and let's read Ezra chapter 10 and we'll just read verses 1 to 17. So while Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel because the people were weeping bitterly. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, of the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra. We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. So therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who also tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task, Ezra, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath. And then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Jehoanan, the son of Eliashib, where he spent the night neither eating bread nor drinking water, for he was mourning over the faithlessness of the exiles. And a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the returned exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem and that if anyone did not come within three days, by order of the officials and the elders, all his property should be forfeited and he himself banned from the congregation of the exiles. Just imagine if you did not arrive for church and we enforced that kind of rule. Verse 9, Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. It was the ninth month on the twentieth day of the month. And all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have broken faith and married foreign women and so increased the guilt of Israel. Now then, make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, it is so, we must do as you have said. But the people are many, and it is a time of heavy rain. We can't stand in the open, nor is this a task for a day or for two, for we have greatly transgressed in this matter. So let our officials stand for the whole assembly. Let all in our cities who have taken foreign wives come at appointed times, and with them the elders and judges of every city 
until the fierce wrath of our God over this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, the son of Asahel, and Jaziah, the son of Tikvah, opposed this, and Meshulam and Shabbatai, the Levite, supported them. Then the returned exiles did so. Ezra the priest selected men, heads of fathers' houses, according to their fathers' houses, each of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to examine the matter. And by the first day of the first month, they had come to the end of all the men who had married foreign women. What we're seeing in Ezra chapter 9 and 10 is a comprehensive description of repentance. And repentance is a big, important biblical word. So the very first word of Jesus' very first sermon was repent. When he sent out the apostles on a training mission to go into cities and to continue his work, he taught them to say, repent. Repent. Before Jesus ascended into heaven and when he delegated his authority to the disciples, he said repentance and the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed. So we really need to understand what this word repentance means. And as I've looked at these two chapters, I don't think there's a better description in the Bible for what repentance is Because it describes the length and the depth or the breadth of repentance. What I mean is it describes Ezra 9 and 10, the process of repentance, because it is a process. But it not only describes the process of repentance, it describes the scope of repentance. It's not just an individual act. It is also a corporate act. So let's start today by looking at this process of repentance. And I think as we'll see, repentance can be described as taking place over three stages. First, recognition. Second, remorse. Third, renunciation. So repentance starts with recognition. And what that means simply is that the first step in turning from sin is admitting that you made a mistake. And that sounds like really obvious, except that in today's age, this is like really a battlefield just at this first step of acknowledging, of admitting, of recognizing that what I've done is actually disobedience and sin. I mean, especially today when our ethical boundaries have been so stretched. I mean, for example, if I think about how the private use of marijuana was legalized in in the end of 2018. So it was previously illegal and obviously sinful for Christians. Now there's question, Christians are questioning this. Add to the fact that we as human beings, we are so prone to justifying our sin. Right, kind of hiding from it. There's so many creative ways to explain how actually it was not my fault. And... Just how often we try and shift the blame, right, and blame other people, all to avoid admitting responsibility for what we have done. And so this step seems so simple, but there's a battlefield here in just admitting that I have sinned. Now, what we're seeing in Ezra 10 is the people very clearly acknowledging their sin. So in verse 2, They come and say, we have broken faith. Later, we have transgressed. They're not trying to duck and dive out of this. They're not trying to blame other people. They are very openly recognizing their sin. Most of them. Because did you pick up? As always, there are a few people who disagree. You think, no, and this is not really a big deal. So we see that in verse 15. Jonathan uh, Jaziah, uh, Meshulam, and Shabbatai, the Levite, they, they opposed this. 
And if you read Meshulam, if you go read verse 26, so the list of names at the end, all of those who had disobeyed, Meshulam's on that list. So he's a guy who did this, and he's going, no, this was not a big deal. So repentance... I mean, it's always, it's a willful act. Repentance doesn't happen. It, just, it doesn't just happen. It's a willful act. It starts with recognition. Secondly, the next step in the process of repentance is remorse. So sometimes people will acknowledge that what they've done is wrong, but there's really no remorse. There's no sorrow over it, which makes you think, well, it... It's obviously not really a big deal to them. Or perhaps their motivation, repenting, is not altogether right. If I think about like my kids and they do something wrong and call them out on it, like they'll go, okay, it's wrong. But really it's just because they know that if they don't acknowledge that, then you're going to punish them. You know what I mean? And so sort of this selfish, it's not really the sense of, man, I can't believe that I transgressed. And that's why genuine repentance always includes remorse, sorrow over our sin. And we see this in Ezra in such a graphic way. I mean, just in verse 1, there's Ezra and people, and they're weeping so bitterly. Other people come and gather because, like, what's with this commotion? That's how intense the remorse was. And then you have in verse 9, it's just this beautiful scene. I love the one sermon that I looked at in preparation for this. The title of Ezra 10 was Repentance in the Rain. You've got all these people gathered in the square before the temple, and it's raining. And we read that all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling, not just because of the rain, trembling because of this matter It's kind of like if you had to make a movie of this. I mean, the end would not be like a typical movie ending where it ends all nicely, but there would just be this really somber scene of people gathered in the rain and they're shivering out of cold, but shivering because they acknowledge there's such remorse when they realize what they have done. And it just makes me think, like, when was the last time I, or for you, when was the last time really wept, or just experienced genuine sorrow over sin. The next step, because we're not done, that repentance hasn't yet finished. The next step in the process of repentance is renunciation. And what I mean by that is the deliberate act of separating yourself from the sin. See, God doesn't just want you to feel bad about your sin. I mean, that's necessary, but He doesn't just want you to be, feel bad about your sin. He wants you to take steps in dealing with it. Because in some ways, as, as hard as it is, the sorrow, this contrition, in some ways, it's easy to feel bad about your sin, to feel guilt. We feel guilt quite easily. It's harder to take steps in actually dealing with it. For example, if you're struggling with something like pornography, you know, I mean, that's, we, we feel that guilt so easily, but like won't take the next step of like making sure your computer's out of the room at night or like installing blocking or accountability software or even like getting rid of your smartphone. Like who would do that? That's crazy, right? And yet we'll hear Jesus saying things so heavy when he talks about the steps to take to remove yourself From the temptation to sin, he'll say things like, if your hand or foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. Uh, If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. I mean, he's emphasizing for effect, don't do that literally, but he is talking about the steps you would be willing to take to separate yourself from your sin. This is where... Ezra 10 gets so difficult, and we mainly dealt with this last week, because the steps that they had to take to finish repentance, to remove themselves from their sin, was to literally separate or divorce the foreign wives that they had married. As we saw last week, they were perhaps permitted to do this. We are not permitted to do that today, but the point is this deliberate steps to separate 
from sin. And so they, uh, Israel says, so now then make confession uh, to the Lord, the God your fathers, and do his will. Do you notice that? Make confession and do his will. Separate yourselves. And the people said with a loud voice, it is so, we must do. As you've said, like we're going to do this. And for once, they meant it. And they followed through. And if you read the rest of that story, like how that played out, they said, hey, but we need more time. This goes further than you think. We need more days. And, and basically, they set up this system where out of 100 people who felt guilty over this, they did it over three months. That means they were investigating three cases a day. It was this extensive, deliberate, long process of separating from sin which is often exactly what it takes. See, we think, when it comes to our sin and acknowledging it and there's remorse, we think that if I feel bad and if I've said sorry, well then, like I'm done, surely? When often what's required is a deliberate process that could be lengthy in overcoming our sinfulness which is not something many people are willing to do. Which is again what makes this willingness to renunciate or separate from sin an indication of genuine repentance. A sign of genuine repentance will include, I will do whatever it takes for as long as it takes to separate myself and make restitution for what I've done. So that's the process of repentance that we see in Ezra 9 and 10. And I just love, like if I had to pick an ending for Ezra 10, I would have picked Ezra 10 verse 2, where Shechaniah says, he says, even though, um, even now, despite this, there is hope for Israel. There is hope in this process of repentance. So that's the process, that's the length of repentance. What we also see in Ezra 9 and 10 is the depth of it or the scope of repentance. So up till now I've been speaking about repentance in a, in a more personal sense, which is something that I think we quite easily identify with. But what we see curiously in Ezra 9 and 10 is not just personal repentance or personal confession. What we see is a corporate confession of sin. In that beautiful scene where it's raining, I mean, it's the whole community, those who have sinned, gather together to confess their sin together as the people of God which is not something that we do too often in the church anymore. Like we often have these moments where we can pause and individually uh, reflect and kind of inwardly confess our sin. We don't often have these moments of together gathering around and openly together confessing our sin and maybe not all confessing the same sin like they did here, but just this communal act of repenting together. Which is like what we did on Wednesday nights at our prayer, Zoom prayer meeting on Wednesday night. We actually did this, kind of this communal, out loud repentance of our sinfulness. And I think if we skip this, what we're seeing here, this corporate confession of sin, we miss out on something beautiful. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that he who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. I mean, just think about that. If you're, you're sitting there today thinking, yeah, that's me. Oh, I'm a sinner. And if you think you're alone, that's the loneliest feeling in the world. But when we together, ideally, if we could see each other, if we were gathered as a church and we're confessing together, we're looking around like you too, you too, you too. Like, like there's this beautiful sense of solidarity in our brokenness. You know, sometimes we come to church with this pretense, I'm okay. And, 
you know, they're not okay. I'm, like, I'm okay. But this corporate confession, these people gathering to go together going, we have sinned to something beautiful. And helping pull those pretenses down. There's solidarity in our brokenness because we all know it. Every one of us. No one has been unaffected by sin. And we all know it. It's a sense of confessing together that is beautiful in its solidarity, but also beautiful as we, we don't just stop there, you know, with sorrow of our sins, we then celebrate forgiveness of our sins together and proclaim the gospel as it were to each other. And that's why today I'm just, I'm so glad we deliberately did this, did communion on this Sunday. I mean, communion is many things, but one of the things it is, we won't be able to see it today as much, but it's a community gathering together to confess together. But that's not all. The scope of repentance extends even further. So he's spoken about two categories of the scope of repentance. There's personal confession and repentance. There's corporate confession of sin. There's a third category that we see here that is a very surprising combination of both personal and corporate. So it's not just corporate confession of sin. What we see in Ezra 9 and 10 is a confession of corporate sin. A confession of corporate sin. Now to me, that's probably the most shocking thing that when I read Ezra 9, and it probably just relates to, to my own journey and where I've been like the last few weeks. But the most shocking thing when I read Ezra 9 is the words of Ezra's prayer. So let me just read them to you again and see if you notice something surprising. So in verse 6 and 7 of Ezra 9, it says, this is Ezra himself praying. And he says, oh my God, I am ashamed and I blush to lift my face to you. I'm embarrassed to look at you. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads. Our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquity, we, our kings, our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the land, the Babylonians, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame. As it is today. That's Ezra's prayer. Now hang on a second now. Just think about this. Ezra's just arrived. He's just appeared on the scene. And he is confessing as saying, I am ashamed. I blush. Our iniquities. Our guilt. But Ezra never committed the sin. Ezra did not intermarry. Ezra is not guilty of the sin. He had nothing to do with it. Nothing. He just arrived. And yet he weeps bitterly and fasts and prays and he repents of the sin as though it were his own sin. Now listen, you've got to see this. It's just, it's mind-blowing. He goes through these stages of, of acknowledging, of grieving, of the sin around him that did not involve him, but he repents as though it were his own sin. And I have started to realize, literally, like over the last month, that there is such a thing. There is this idea, this truth corporate responsibility for sin. That I am responsible, that I can be responsible in some instances for the sin of those around me, even if it didn't involve me. That's this idea of corporate responsibility for sin. Now, I first came across this conversation, this difficult conversation that has been taking place over race, 
for Black Lives Matter, white guilt, etc. And so let me just tell you how I've been trying to process this, just myself. It's so fresh and new to me. And Ezra 9 and 10 really confronted me in this. So I think most of us, when we think about racism, most of us would say, hey man, like I'm not a racist. Most of us, maybe some wouldn't, but hopefully most of us would say, yeah, I do not deliberately practice putting somebody down because of their race. Of course, I think as we're all coming to realize, and as Justin prayed for us, we realize there's just levels of prejudice that are being open to us that is such an important part of our own journeys. But we may say I'm not a practicing racist in that I do not deliberately commit sins of racism. But see, this is what's so new to me, and this is what we're seeing here. There is this next step beyond me and and my racism and my prejudice. There's this next step, the step of recognizing that even though I may not be committing deliberate acts of racism, that by participating or being connected to a collective that does commit these acts, or even being historically connected to a collective that did commit these acts, that I hold some responsibility for this and that it would be appropriate for me to repent as a member of this collective. And let me just say that again, because I thought long and hard about that phrase. And in fact, I had the wording wrong, even just this morning. Because I said this morning what I had written in the end, it would be appropriate for me to repent on behalf of. No, it's not that. It's not on behalf of. It's not like we are interceding for or mediating between. It's not what Ezra's doing. So listen to that again. There's this next step. I mean, maybe you already knew this, but I'm pretty sure there's so many out there who are learning this as I am learning this. There's this next step of recognizing that even though I may not now be committing these deliberate sins of racism, that by participating, by being connected to a collective that is doing it, or even uh, historically being connected to that collective, I hold some responsibility. And it would be appropriate for me to repent as being a member of this collective or community. In other words, let me just tell you simply what that means in my life. So as I'm journeying through this this conversation of racism, I I never thought that, the thought never occurred to me to, to apologize or confess or repent of apartheid. So I'm like, I did not design that. I did not have an opportunity to vote for it. You know, that's like, I wasn't complicit in it. I mean, you can't be held responsible for something you didn't do, right? Well, what I'm learning is that it's such an individualistic way of thinking that comes very naturally. It's very obvious to a more Western worldview but less obvious to other worldviews, African worldviews, and yes, the Old Testament Hebrew way of thinking. See, that's why Ezra's praying this. He's including himself as responsible, even though he's not. He includes himself as though he is. And we also see it very interesting in chapter 10. So in chapter 10, verse 2, we see, And Shechaniah... The son of Jehiel, of the sons of Elam, addresses Ezra. Now, who's Shechaniah? No clue. Never seen him before. He just pitches up. And he's like, he's instigating this. He's like, hey, Ezra, you take care of this. So he's, he's a leader here. And all we actually know about Shechaniah is that he's the son of Jehiel, sons of Elam. And if you go read the list at the end, that's why we have that list at the end. If you go read that list at the end, you will see that, firstly, Shechaniah's name's not on it. He has no part in this. He did not commit this sin. 
But Jehiel's name is there. Verse 26. Jehiel of the sons of Elam. In other words, Shekinah is coming to Ezra. And notice his words. We have sinned. He didn't. His father did. Shekinah is coming before Ezra, repenting of the sins of his father, not on his behalf, as though it was his own. I mean, I first saw this. I mean, that's, how hard is this? How hard must that moment have been? And Ezra, now is what we need to do, to separate. This is his family. Guys, this is really hard, isn't it? But hey, isn't that what we're here for on a Sunday morning? Is to read the Bible and let it confront our lives. Because I can't tell you how I was all this thinking on race and corporate responsibility. I'm like, wow, are you serious? There's such a thing? And then came Ezra 9. And listen... When you see it now, you'll see it all over the Bible. So let me give you some examples. We've got a little bit of time, and I just feel like we we can't just leave this. We've got to make some progress in this conversation. You see it all over the Bible. Let me give you such an important example. Daniel 9. You don't have to turn there now, but just write it down and just go read Daniel 9. Daniel, it's so important because Daniel's happening. The story of Daniel is happening at the same time period. Remember that? So Daniel's still back in Babylon. If you read the story of, of Daniel, there's Nebuchadnezzar, there's Darius, same time period. So Dan, Daniel's with the exiles in Babylon, and there comes this moment where he realizes the reason we're in exile is because of all the sin. And in Daniel 9, Daniel prays a prayer of repentance as though the sin were his own. He says, we have sinned, same language, we have done wrong, we have acted wickedly and rebelled, but it wasn't him, it was generations before him. We've turned aside from your commandments and rules, we haven't listened to your servants, the prophets, but let me tell you, Daniel... It's like Ezra, when he came across the character Ezra, I was like, man, Ezra is this perfect guy, it just seems like it. Daniel's the same, I mean just perfect, never puts a foot wrong. We don't see him deliberately committing any of this. But he prays this prayer. He realizes they are in exile because of God's judgment on them, not a few individuals. And he repents, not on their behalf, as one of the collective. And here's what's so amazing about Daniel 9. You just got to go and read this. It's amazing. He prays his prayer, and the angel Gabriel turns up. I mean, just, (laughs) I do not see angels, generally. Um, Daniel, the angel Gabriel, I mean, he's a real angelic head of the army of the angels. Actually, I mean, that was Michael, but he's like this head angel, angel, appears to Daniel himself. And says, Daniel, yes, that's why you're in exile. And then he says this. He says, and now you will see that in a matter of weeks, the exiles, an opportunity will come and they will go home. They'll go back to Jerusalem. What's that story? That's the Ezra story. You piece these together. It's almost like Daniel recognizing this and Daniel praying, Daniel's courage to own corporate responsibility and to grieve and repent. Would it be a stretch to say that that is what unlocks the door for the exiles to go back, for the story of Ezra to take place? I want to say that if we have the courage, this takes great courage, this takes great courage, but if we have the courage to step into the zone of accepting corporate responsibility for sin, which is just far bigger than individual Perhaps that is the key that can unlock acts of revival. Now, let me just say this. I said two more things and then we'll end. Let me say this. There are limits here. 
Because it would not be appropriate. I hate to leave you with thinking it's now appropriate, man. Like, I'm responsible then for all the sins of the whole world for all time. Like, Christians should repent of the Crusades. I mean, no. I mean, we lament that it happened, but it's not appropriate. It's superfluous. I think it waters down the act of repentance if it's just, there are limits to this. And you see this in the Bible. You see it in the book of Acts. It's interesting. Let me just play this out just real quick for you. Quick tour of Acts and the idea of corporate responsibility. Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches to the crowd. Thousands have gathered. They gathered from all over the world. They're in Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. Right? So they, most of them were not there when Jesus was crucified. And when Peter is preaching the gospel, he talks about Jesus, and he says this to the crowd, you killed him. You did. And like, no. God's probably looking around going, what do, you, what do you mean? You killed him. Acts chapter 3, same thing. He's preaching in Solomon's portico. You killed the author of life, he says. Same thing. Acts 5, Acts 6. The, uh, they are not shy of saying to all around, you, you were complicit, even though they probably were not there. Even though they probably did not shout Barabbas instead of Jesus. Even though they had nothing to do with the system. You did. See, because for them, in their thinking, that's, that's natural. And in the way of the Bible, that is natural. But then, from about Acts 10 onwards, it starts to change. In Acts 10, Peter's talking to Cornelius, a Gentile, and he speaks about what happened, and he says, they killed him. It's not saying you anymore. In Acts 13, Paul is now talking in Antioch, and he's talking to Jews, and he talks about Jesus in Jerusalem, and he says, those Jews <laughs> killed him. It's no longer this inclusive language. So what does this mean? What it means is, the Bible has a category for corporate responsibility of sins. And it can extend across generations. It ex can extend across peoples and countries. But it does have limits. The stronger the ties that bind you to what's happening, the more responsible, or the stronger the argument for corporate identification. Let me just tell you what that means. Just... So in listening to Americans process this, this is a lot of information coming my way. It's like, so should we repent of slavery? I mean, emancipation of slavery in America is 1863. It's like 150 years. Seems like there's enough distance between that. And while you lament it, and while certainly at this moment you repent of being complicit in systemic injustice, to apologize for and repent of something that happened 150 years before seems too disconnected to me. But what about here? What about me? What about my question? What about now? I was 14 when we had our first democratic elections. So I was self-aware. I've grown up in a generation of people who've been directly affected, who still are directly affected. There's no way that I can say that I am far enough removed to not be responsible. And I don't think for a long time we will be able to say that. One last thing. The reason we can talk about this with such freedom, actually, is when we realize that, hey, this idea of corporate responsibility is actually part of the foundation of the gospel. Here's what I mean. If you want to stand and go, no, <laughs> Western worldview, individualistic, I will only be responsible for what I have done, then you're in trouble. Because then you will be accountable for your own sins and your own good works will be credited to you, but it will never be enough to atone for your sins. It is only by willfully associating with Jesus Christ by faith, which is corporate responsibility language. I didn't die on the cross. He did. But I'm identifying with him, and by his righteousness, I am righteous. Bottom line is this. If we have more opportunity to acknowledge sin, which is hard, 
And that's what's been happening in my life. But if we have more opportunity to acknowledge sin, we also have great opportunity to be grateful for Jesus, to love Jesus. That's what this can do. So let's pray. And then we are going to corporately confess in an act of communion. Father, I pray now simply by your Holy Spirit. I know, Holy Spirit, you bring conviction of sin. You're the only one that can get into our hearts and to help us see where there is brokenness, personal. And you can open our eyes to corporate brokenness. God, would you do that? And church, if you are bold enough, pray that. God, open my eyes. Open our eyes to see how we are connected to the brokenness of the world around us. And then, Holy Spirit, help us see Jesus who died for, who atoned for all of it for all time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.